in my classes, I, I teach uh, Frankenstein every year. I teach 12th grade uh, standard and honors. I'm, I'm not going to talk to you today as a teacher anymore. Uh, after I say this, I just want to talk to you about writing from a writer's perspective. And not a successful writer's perspective, but a, a writer's perspective, someone who has gotten, you know, dozens and dozens of rejection slips for many, many, many years, and then finally, you know, kicks over into the beginning of half century, you know, two, and suddenly starts getting published. So I'm coming to you from that perspective, it's not really somebody who's had extraordinary success or novels published and made into movies, but somebody who's just written personally and then had late in life, if you count this point in my life as late in life, then, then I would say late in life success and, and sort of a different trajectory. But I've always sort of lived a writer's life because writers, when you think about the, the book Frankenstein, the one teacher thing I wanted to say to you was, I always start out asking them the question, do you think monsters are born or do you think they're made? And we sort of go back and forth on that when we look at what Frankenstein really was. And this question could be posed about writers too. Do you think that writers are born or do you think they're made? And I think I come to the same conclusion on both. I think it is both. I think that you are born with certain ways of seeing that come, may come from intellect or, or whatever. And DNA, I think writing has to be in your DNA to a certain extent. But I also think writers are made. I don't think that you just know everything there is to know about being a writer when you set a pen to paper. I think that you have to teach yourself how to write. So I have some rules for writing, but before I go into that, I want to just tell you a little bit about myself. So this is the, the autobiographical part, and I'll try to keep this short because we don't have all day long for me to tell you every last thing about my life. I wouldn't do that anyway. But the things that pertain to writing, as far as I'm concerned, the DNA. Um, on my mother's side of the family, I come from a long line of Native American and French uh, and Irish people, and that's a very weird mixture of ethnic groups. And um, there's also a little bit of African American in my family tree as well. So there's a lot of different you know, ways of seeing the world there. I was told by my great aunt right before she died that my real um, maternal uh, gr like great, great, three or four times great grandmother was actually full-blooded Native American and was hidden with a white family during the Trail of, not, yeah, during the Forced March, the Trail of Tears, when they sent the Native Americans west. And that the parents walked, but the little baby was placed with this family and grew up and passed for white, as they used to say back then. And so they raised her up and she grew up to marry a Union general. And at the same time, dinner table, there was uh, a man who aspired and eventually became a captain of the Union Army, and then his little brother, who was uh, fairly highly placed in the Rebel Army, and they would have those literal brother-to-brother -brother discussions and then went their separate ways and really did uh, fight each other on the battlefield, so all of that. I come from the same family tree as Elvis. We share the same like great 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 uncle so that would ma have made him where he's still with us on earth and he died so long ago in 77 but he would have he was my like fourth or fifth cousin i did not uh, didn't I know him. him but our families were close <laughs> to each other and i've met a lot of people at this school who are part of my family since i've gotten here teachers and students who who were part of that family too so it's a huge family and um they are also, as I said, the French, the Irish, and whatever else I said, the Native American, and, and all those other, you know, just the melting pot. The person who influenced me more than any, any other person in my life was my dad. My dad was all these things at once. He was a metro cop and eventually a drug, uh, undercover drug agent. And he was also a piano player on Printer's Alley. I'll try to explain how all this worked. This was his day at work, three different jobs. And then he was the midnight to six, no, he would have been the six to midnight shift. The six to midnight shift at WLAC FM, and, and he spun records, and he went to the DJ conventions and all that kind of stuff. So I come from this background of people who were in music. Everyone's in music. It's like if there's a person in our family who's not in music, they're considered, you know, not exactly 
you know, th well, their, their DNA is questioned. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> they don't believe that they're part of it. My very first house I ever lived in, I was brought home from the hospital. I was born in Nashville at the old St. Thomas Hospital and brought home to Battery Lane. Now, Battery Lane is in a very swank part of Nashville. We rented the house from uh, my mom's mom. And that was the last time I ever lived in a neighborhood anyone would ever covet the address. Um, from there, we moved all over the place. And, and one of the things I talk about is how writers are made. Um, I became a writer in part because from very young, I was sort of ripped up out of my comfort zone and taken all over the United States and back and forth between Western New York, where my dad was from originally, and, um, and back here. My dad's side of the family is a real study in history because my dad's mom, and this is not a joke, he, she was a burlesque dancer in vaudeville. Y'all have probably learned in your deep dark past about vaudeville. So they had all these comedians who went on to become big names. Red Skelton changed my dad's diaper, I'm told, and um, all this kind of stuff. And these are people's names that are like long been history and no one knows them now, but they were very big. Uh, comedians back then, so they, they were in a circus environment, in a tent existence during the Depression. My dad was born in 31 um, in, in a farmhouse, you know, no doctors around, and so uh, my, my grandfather was an 18-year-old boy, just came to the vaudeville show to see the burlesque dancers and showed up and liked my grandmother, and then the rest is history, and then he, they didn't work out, and my grandfather went back to Nashville and became a cop. And uh, when my dad was 21 years old, he hitchhiked from Buffalo, New York with a pair of drumsticks. Like I said, he was a musician. He was playing music all over Buffalo. And he hitchhiked, and he, he took the drumsticks with him, and he threw them away in Fort Knox, Kentucky. And he hitched rides all the way here. He walked right up to his dad. He'd never met him. And he said, hello, I'm Ron Mosier, and I'm your son. And so that was my dad. My dad was larger than life. He, he had those three jobs, not at different times. He wasn't trying stuff out. He worked all three at the same time. He went from one to the other to the other. It should be no shock to you that he died at the age of 52. And uh, so I lost my dad when, when I was a, a young 20s. And uh, he's been gone. My mother's still living. That, that side of the, the DNA family, apparently longevity. So she's 84 and still, still going and goes to more soirees and parties and things than I've ever gone to. She is the social <laughs> butterfly. I will never be able to catch up with her. So that's those people. Um, my dad wrote, he wrote for the Nashville Banner, which is no longer a paper. He wrote um, for uh, magazines. He wrote a book. Uh, he never published, but he wrote all the time. And one of the things my dad taught me is that it doesn't matter if it gets published. You write for you. Uh, and what my dad gave me uh, was music. That, uh, and then my mother, her, her side of the family, obviously gave, gave me music. So we, we had it coming in both ways. When I was approximately, you know, when you get old, you start forgetting how old you were when stuff happened. That's starting to worry me because I tell people I was so and so old, and they say the math doesn't work. Lisa, you know, fix it. It's not. That's not how old you were. It could possibly be. Um, I was about 29 years old when uh, I had a three-year-old child. I had just gone back to college. I had a really good friend who drove me to what we used to call the Kremlin, the business office over at MTSU let me out of the car and said, do not come back to the parking lot until you have an application filled out and turned in. I had quit college to move all around the country with the man I married. He was an Air Force guy. We moved everywhere. Um, the marriage didn't work out, but the, the life uh, time, uh, you know, thing that I got from that was being able to write about anywhere in the United States. The only place in the United States I haven't lived is the Pacific Northwest. I've lived almost everywhere. When I travel with my friends, they say, shut up, stop telling us that that's the exit to where you used to live. Because mm -hmm. they literally have lived in every region, and it gets tiresome to travel with me because of that. But I can write about uh, south southeastern New Mexico. I spent some time in uh, Juarez, Mexico, before it you know, really got drug infested by the cartels. And uh, I lived uh, in western New York, and I lived in Cape Cod, Massachusetts. I lived in Biloxi, Mississippi. I spent a lot of time in southern Mississippi because the food is really good, so I kept going back. <laughs> and uh, I spent a lot of time in Houma, Louisiana for the same reason. And so I, before I was 22, I had lived so many places that it just added to my life in ways that I can't even articulate. But every book I write is set in one of those places because you have to write what you know. You can't set it in Milan if you've never been there. But I can set it in Alamogordo and Juarez, and I can set it in 
Cape Cod and I can have people travel from here to there and that's a big part of writing that I want to get across to you is get out and see the world and get out and do stuff and then write about it you know that's the deal um, when I was 29 uh, I was in college I had three papers due I had just received a letter that let me know that a song that I had written was up for a Dove Award. I did not know the thing had even been nominated, and I didn't know that anybody knew who I was, let alone what the song was. But I had recorded this song, and I had mailed it off to somebody, and unbeknownst to me, they gave it to somebody, and that person gave it to somebody, and so on and so on. It wound up at the Gospel Music Association Dove Award nomination committee. So I'm painting my walls gray. I don't know why. I think it matched my mood at the time. I have no idea why I chose to paint my living room gray. I ended up painting the whole house gray except for one room. There's was only a happy room in the whole house after that. So I'm painting and I'm painting and I'm thinking about the papers I have to write for school because yes I did fill out the application. Yes I did go back to college at MTSU. And I'm looking at this letter thinking, I am not seeing on the Dove Awards. There is not any way that I'm going on this program. There's not, I have to have Prozac, whatever that is. I've got to have it if I'm going to go on there because there's no way I can do this. So the phone rings, and it's a doctor from um, St. Thomas Hospital, the same hospital where I was born, if you've been paying attention. And so uh, the voice says, uh, you've got your brother. He's in grave condition, intensive care. He died three times in the ambulance on the way to St. Thomas. We didn't even have time to arrange a life flight. We ambulance, they ambulanced him here from Lewisburg. You need to come right now. So I dropped the paint can, I dropped everything. I called my sister, I'm looking for my car keys, and we meet, and we decided to take my mom's car Afterwards, we cannot find the car. We're so distraught, we forgot where we parked. It took us four hours to find the stupid Nissan. Because back then, everyone in Tennessee drove a Nissan, and we could not find this car. It was unbelievable. We get to the hospital. My brother is seriously in grave condition, and I'm told that only 8% of his heart is actually still alive. Now, y'all know 8% is not much. 8% of his heart is alive, the rest of it has died, the result of a virus. We don't know what kind of virus it attacked his heart. Now I'm 28, going on 29 at this time, and my brother is 39 years old. So I'm, I'm going down to the hospital twice a day for 15 minute increments, 11 to 11.15 I can see him, and again at 2 to 2.15. Any more would tax his heart too much. And he's in a drug-induced coma, so I'm really just going down there to check on the situation, not really to have big, long conversations with brother about what happened to him. Seven weeks almost to the day, um, a heart comes in. He's been on the, the waiting list. We, we, we've been told that he, he probably won't make it as long as it will take the heart to come in. The heart comes in just at a point where his kidneys and his liver are really not wanting to work anymore. A uh, poor young man, a precious kid, uh, 19 years old, dies in a motorcycle accident in Alabama on I-65. He has told his parents, if anything ever happened to him, please let someone use uh, anything that he had that, that they could use, a heart included. My brother couldn't just have anybody's heart. He started out at 235, 510 and a half. He was a big guy anyway. But with all the water weight gain, because his heart it, you know, wasn't pumping oxygen, his kidneys weren't working, he weighed 345 on the bed. They have an actual weight. Those of you who've been in the hospital or visited somebody, you know they weigh you just in the bed. And he weighed 345 in the hospital bed. So the heart came in. He had uh, the transplant, okay, and this was in 94. So I call up the Dove Committee and say, no can do on this concert, cannot come and sing this thing, so, you know, sorry. And I move my brother in, and I end up taking care of my brother for several uh, months, and we learn how to cook what he can eat. So my life was sort of on this one trajectory, and then I sort of just stepped off, you know, onto the side of the road. And when I stepped on the side of the road, I, I didn't stop writing songs. I, I had been writing songs for a long time, and then, I ended up, though, changing my attitude about writing because I think a lot of the writing I did, I was writing for me, but I also had an eye towards, hey, you know, maybe something could happen to this song and it would be, you know, it would become uh, successful and someone would record it. And I sort of had a, a mind to that. There's nothing wrong with that. The problem was 
uh, I think maybe I got pulled to the side of the road for a reason. So I just started writing for me. I didn't write to be published. I didn't write to try to go out there and do anything. I wrote, I played out still sometimes, but uh, that kind of tapered off and I changed from writing songs to writing um, short stories and novels. So I want to tell you, fast forward to today, and you'll either find this funny or incredibly sad. I share a, an anniversary. Y'all know you've been watching the coverage on TV. This is J the 50th anniversary of JFK's assassination. Um, so I was born on October the 17th of 63, okay? And then JFK was shot in Dallas on November the 22nd. So it's been 50 years since he was assassinated. And this is, was my 50th birthday. It's even found surreal to say it. You know, it just is very weird. But uh, October was my birthday. And for the, the, this is the first year that other than the award, uh, which I got but could not show up to receive, um, I have two now short stories published. And uh, one of them is Mass which I'm going to probably read a couple lines from in a minute. I know that's what people do at these things, and this is my first, so forgive me, because I'm probably breaking all the rules. But this part uh, that I want to talk to you for just a second, and then I'm going to take some questions, try to fit all this in, uh, is uh, rules of writing. And I've changed my rules for writing. I had different rules for writing, especially when I thought about writing as a teacher. Um, but, but I was a writer before I was ever a teacher, and I'm still a writer. It's a thing that will always be with me and never, never end. So here are my rules for writing. And you don't have to take notes. Some of you take mental notes. That's how you do everything, and, and you do quite swimmingly well with it. So um, here they are. Uh, writing is a way of seeing the world. And it's also a way of hearing, because writers listen. That's my first rule. Writers is a way of seeing the world, and writing is about listening. Writers listen more than anybody else does. If you've always got your head all you know messed up with stuff and you've got stuff entering your head all the time you don't have space to create you have to listen to get the creative force going and sometimes you have to walk away from what someone else is singing and playing and doing and and you have to walk away from from people sometimes and that's what makes it such a dichotomy you know writers write about people but they often have to stay away from them for a long times to get something written and it's a real weird kind of combo there and um, that's its own set of issues. Um, I was at a Cracker Barrel just to show you how a writer listens. And in the booth behind me, there was a mom and a dad, and they were talking to their daughter. And the mom got up to leave, and the dad just, evidently the daughter and the dad were closer than the daughter and the mom, and they just started talking, you know, truth. Truth just started coming out. And I was listening to this, and the dad would say things like, you know, but we just want so much for you, and we wanted more for you. And we don't really like this guy that you're with. And so I was listening, and there were so many things that they were saying. And I wound up using that scene later in, in a book. And that's what happens to you is you just you put it all together. And you don't have any idea how it's going to come out, but it just does. Um, what you, uh, this is number two, what you uh, leave out is more important than what stays in. And the only reason I say that is because if you don't take out what needs to be gotten rid of, if you don't carve it out, uh, what's left is going to get lost in a bunch of trash. So be willing not to be in love with your prose. Be willing to, to kill your darlings and throw away your favorite lines because sometimes those aren't the best lines. It's hard, hard to say why you like something, but it just has to have an effect on you. Uh, Chekhov said to make a face from marble, you must carve away everything that is not the face. And I can't say it any better than that. Uh, three comes from Stephen King, and I found out this is true. Write with the door closed, revise with the door open. Um, shut the door in the privacy of your mind and your soul. Write whatever you want to write and don't judge yourself. But when you get ready to edit, when you get ready to revise, open that door and let the world in a little bit. Think about how other people would read that and how it would impact them and let that be your guide when you revise. Uh, writing is the last act of privacy. That's not a rule, it's just a fact. You file it under rule number three. Um, it's an act of pure imagination, and therefore uh, the written word is a danger to tyrants and idiots. So keep writing for that reason alone. Um, four, I want you to know that writing is a whole brain function. There's a lot of things that you can do and learn that are either right brain or left brain, and they don't cross over. Writing crosses over. Even if you got into a car accident and your right brain was horribly mangled but the left brain was okay, you could still write because writing is both art and skill. It's a whole brain function, 
And so people that we label learning disabled or people that we say are special needs, it doesn't matter. Since the whole brain's involved, whatever's still awake up there, it's gonna work for you, you can write. Um, be willing to learn what you don't know. Uh, the person who taught me more about writing than anybody else I never had for an English class, and that's pretty typical. It's usually someone who speaks into your life who teaches you about writing and not the person who's standing up and paid to do the job. And I say that being a teacher, I'll, I'll say it till, till I die. Uh, Nancy Jackson was a teacher here at Oakland. She retired last year and she told me that I apologized too much. I qualified everything. I think I believe, I didn't, I didn't initially say, I think I believe in my opinion, but I had my way of apologizing every time I wanted to say something. Um, and she taught me not to do that. She said, when you write, you're preaching the gospel according to you. And you should be able to stand up on the roof and preach it and say it without qualification. Let the other guy argue against you. Let someone else come along and show the world where you're wrong. But if you don't get that out there, then the truth's not going to meet somewhere in the middle. So uh, writing is preaching, but it's not judging. There's a huge difference. The best preachers don't judge. They encourage, right? So don't apologize. And because of that, we have banned adverbs forever from all of writing. Um, it's not important how you walked down the aisle, whether it was gingerly or sadly or cleverly or whatever you did, because that steals an opportunity for you to give a visual. So she taught me to get rid of adverbs. She taught me to get rid of forms of the verb to be. She taught me that the power of the sentence was subject and vivid active verb. If you can do something, it's a verb. You can't is. None of you can stand up and is. I dare you to try. And she taught me that. And it's been invaluable to me. And the other thing that you've probably heard before is show and don't tell. Don't tell me how I'm supposed to feel about something. Show me what the person's doing. Okay? Um, I want to read to you really quickly a little piece of this. Uh, if you have the short story, I'm just going to find a little paragraph. And it is on page 184, whether you've got the book version. If you don't have this, I'll just read it to you. Uh, it's in Best New Writing, and it's an anthology for which uh, they were considering people for something called the Eric Hoffer Award, and I was dumb enough to enter, and I didn't know who Eric Hoffer was, so I had to real quick Google him and find out who he was, and I found out he was a 20th century philosopher who tried to um, study the Nazis' um, methods of getting people's attention, getting their hearts and minds, the German heart and mind, and so he thought that they used the same types of methods that are used in religion to try to, you know, in cults, to try to get people to join cults. He, so he, he had a little comparison going there. So this is in the perspective of a girl who has died. And she's uh, pretty much talking about everything that's happened in her life and in others' lives. Because from where she stands, she can see all lives everywhere. So this is on the bottom of 184, if you're following along, the few copies we have. Sometimes Dad smokes a cigar in the room Mom made into a study for him, his 49th birthday present. I don't pretend to know what he is thinking. Mom wanders by once in a while, but other than offering him the occasional scone or cold drink, she leaves him to his ritual. Miles Davis, Cigarillo, newspaper. I have seen him write a few words in the notebook. I think he wants to set down what happened, maybe try to explain it to himself. I wish I could sit down and talk to him, tell him about stupid death, and how it doesn't make any sense. But then he might not write at all. And I suppose writing is a good thing, especially if you're trying to write your way out of a dark place. I think a lot of people can identify with the last part of that. I know I can, because a lot of times I've been in that dark place and I know I've written my way out of it. It wasn't anything that I necessarily published and nobody gave me an award for it, but it got written. And it, it was a creation that didn't exist before um, and then now it does and so that's the miracle to me uh, that is writing. Anybody have any questions? I'd be glad to try and answer them. I can't promise I know the answer, but yes. Uh, well, once you're done writing and you went through that process and you're going through your revision, yes. I think my main problem is writing a paper or just writing leisurely. You get to the point where you're either willing to listen to someone's revisions and it's basically their 
their piece now, or you're so mad that you don't even want to listen to it. Okay. Because it's like, I wow. don't agree. So, so what would you? How would you explain like what you went through? That that's, a, that's one of the best questions I've ever been asked about writing. That's excellent. Okay, a couple things. First of all, Flannery O'Connor revised her stories after publication until death. She was never happy with them. I want you to know that. If you're a writer in this room, please take heart. One of the best writers, certainly the South ever produced, was never finished. She never thought her stories were good enough. She only published them because that's what writers do. If you want to be a writer, eventually, if you want to make a living at it, you got to publish something once in a while or people sort of say, hey, you know, all this writing, I think you need to go try something else because this is not working for you. But Flannery O'Connor always revised all her stories after publication. Um, another thing is Stephen King says this in On Writing. If you've never read On Writing, go get it this weekend and read it. Read it all the way through in one sitting and you'll, you'll never be the same on writing. He says when you write something, walk away from it. So here's what I would advise. Revise the entire time that you are writing. Like go back and carve that face out of that marble all the time. But then walk away from it and don't look at it. He suggests six months. I have done that. I almost forgot I ever wrote the thing. I found something by accident one time because I took the Stephen King advice. I walked away for, from it for six months. And I said, oh, yeah. Oh, then it was in the bottom of a drawer. And I had printed a little bit out because I wanted to read it. Or it was on some computer that I don't use anymore. It had died. You know, and then I, I, I resuscitated it and found. So the six-month rule is a little dangerous. But you know, he writes all the time. He doesn't do much else except talk about writing. So he can afford that. And when the teacher's begging for it, you can't do, you know, I don't try that. Don't tell Mr. Nance it's a six month thing and I'm taking a <laughs> from it. And I can't, you know, I possibly turn it in uh, till, till next uh, fall. But, uh, but I will say this, I would, I would suggest that you go ahead and do something in the heat of the moment. Revise it one good time and then shove it in a drawer and walk away a while and go do something else. You know, whatever it is that you do, you know, just run around and do it instead. When you come back, you'll be a different person. Those are excellent questions. I'll also say this. Ernest Hemingway said, uh, oh, symbolism is overrated. He said, uh, once I write it, it's not mine anymore. It belongs to you. It's whatever you think it is. You go teach a class on it. I, I'm done with it. I think that's good advice. If you're saying, is it going to be theirs if they give you too much advice? It's going to be other people's anyway once it's published. It won't be yours anymore. It'll belong to everyone else then, anyhow. Anybody else have a question? Well, I do, but I don't know if it's one you can actually answer. Well, I don't know. We'll see. Um, it was, I have trouble when writing um, fitting in character descriptions uh, because I feel like every single time I write a character description, it's at the wrong point of time. I get you. Well, at least you got an ear for it. At least you can hear that the piano note is clunking and it's not. It's in discord. That's excellent. You got an ear. Characters are what they do and not what they wear. Characters are what they do and not how they look. Um, I have an image in my mind, and I'll give you a good example. Y'all are too young for this, but one day when on A and E when they have the retired people's movies come on and, and you watch uh, the firm with Tom Cruise. Um, Y'all know who I'm talking about, John Grisham, the lawyer, writer, yeah, softball player, all these, all those things. Dad, um, the, the, I read The Firm before the movie came out. Many people did. Um, Y'all didn't, but I did. And um, I had in my mind how the main character looked. And I was extremely happy with my mental fantasy of how this man looked. And I wanted him to look that way. And I don't have anything against Tom Cruise. He's a good looking man still yeah. to this day. We're about the same age, you know, and he looks great. And, uh, but uh, my, my mind, man, did not look like that. I had this whole other thing going on, and so I was extremely unhappy. So, so I, as the reader, when you're writing, I'm already getting an image in my mind of what your characters look like. Don't, don't question me. I, I'm, it's working, it's going. So it's what they do and what they say and how they say it that is really what a character is. It's not how you describe it. Minister Nance's book is an excellent example of that. You do not get lost in endless descriptions, but you know where you are and you're there. You're just there. You don't have to wonder where you are, who you're looking at. You know, it's, ex it's well done. It has a lot of adverbs though. 
That's okay. <laughs> I liked yours. Yeah, I, I can't, can't use them. Yeah. My days <laughs> fall flat when I try to do it. Other questions? Uh, another one. Um, how did you deal with not getting so into your characters once you wrote your book? I think while you write your book, your characters are alive, and I don't think you're a good writer if you're not at least a little obsessed. And I jokingly tell my husband, who claims he has OCD, he's an artist too, he's a visual art person, and um, I always tell him, you know, I'm so glad I don't have OCD, ha ha ha, I'm so much better than you, you know, that's how I kind of lord it <laughs> over him. And because I'm really... Um, he would never say I was easy to live with, and I wouldn't either, but I would say that I'm easygoing. Stuff doesn't rattle me. Stuff doesn't bother me. I've, I've, you know, my dad and I had to sleep in cars looking for a place to live. We've had stuff happen to us that was really just real. You know, we had real stuff going on. Y'all have too. So, at, you know, when things are going kind of okay and normal, I'm sort of like, oh, yeah, you know, it's okay. Yeah, medical bill, that's okay. And he just gets all rattled. But um, I think that the only obsessive compulsive disorder that writers really have other than I know a lot of them drink you know, yeah. or whatever yeah. Yeah. It, it don't do that because that doesn't help but Stephen King is prime example of that um, he started writing really well when he finally stopped drinking but um, and he'll still tell you that I'm sure but I, I think that you have to, to love, know and love or hate your characters, whatever you're supposed to be doing there. And I think they really are alive, and I think you do get wrapped up. What you don't want to get wrapped up in is your own language and the way you use it. You do not want to fall in love with every last word and paragraph. Yeah, and it, you know. But the characters, while you're writing the book, they're your family. Uh, you know, unfortunately, that's how it is. It's weird. Other questions you have? Anything that you want to ask about reading, about books? A lot of times I get asked what my favorite book is. That's always a good question. I don't know if it really reveals much about a person. The book that hit me over the head and knocked me down the most was Barbara Kingsolver's Poisonwood Bible. I, I, if you've never read it, you should. If you want to be a writer, it's something you should read. It takes place in Africa. Um, it's a missionary white family thinking they're going to go over there and show people how to live. Turns out, you know, they have their own issues. And every chapter is a different character's perspective, a different member of the family. And if you've ever thought about writing a book like that, where you have multiple points of view, and that brings up something else. Um, I went to, you've never, probably never heard of this person. There's a children's book writer named Marion Dane Bauer, spoke at Vanderbilt University and changed my life in the same way Nancy Jackson did later on. And she told me this, and this is worth writing down and carrying out of here with you and, and remembering. You can only be in one character's mind at a time. It's like soul possession. You can put the skin on of a character and walk around as that character. But you guys, those of you who are writing, you can't shift point of view in the middle of a segment. You can't go there unless you break it off and pick up a new section with the character you're wanting to go to next. In the same paragraph, I have seen writers try to, to shape shift and morph from one soul to another you can't give the cop's perspective as he's interviewing the witness and the witness's perspective as she's responding to the cop. It's got to come through one soul at a time. And that's what Marion Dane Bauer taught me, and before that I was lost, and after she told me that, I started writing. And that's how that went down. Is that why it's a good way to, when you do certain chapters, focus on one character? Yes. 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 That's what I'm doing. It's not necessary. And I'm writing a book now where the entire thing was chapter by chapter, someone else's point of view. It's kind of like a, it's not lost, but you remember how lost went back in time in every character's life. It showed you what happened before they got to yeah. the island. Everybody had a backstory, right? It was like MTV behind the scenes and all this backstory. You know? <laughs> so everybody had that. And I'm writing a book now that's like that. But in the end, when stuff starts happening so fast that everybody's involved, what I do is I pick one character's soul to occupy, and then I look at all the others through that one. And then I'll, in the same chapter, I may have a break. Editors love the little number sign. Number sign, now I'm in someone else's soul. 
and then I go to the next soul and possess them and walk around as them. And so, but you can't do you you can't do it in the same paragraph, right? Right. And I've seen I've seen professionals writers do that, and it's wrong, unless you are omniscient, limited omniscient third person. You can't do it. Now, if you decide you want to be objective. Do y'all remember Stephen Ambrose, uh, Occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge? He has three different perspectives going. If you don't remember that from, from a junior year, a Civil War era literature, go back and read that thing. That's a study in, in perspective and point of view. It's a objective and first person and third person limited omniscient. So if you're objective, do y'all know what objective is? I'm a camera. All you know is what my camera sees, right? And then there's omniscient, I'm God. I know what y'all are thinking. I know what everybody's thinking. And that's all right. It works if you start out with that. Like, let's say you have a committee meeting going on, and you're wanting to write an omniscient. Then you have everybody's thought process in italics, of course, because that's the way it's supposed to be done, apparently. And then what they say is in quotes, and then what they're really thinking is in italics, and you've got that for everybody. But that's God. But that's okay if you start out that way, but once you start out, you can't quit. When you bring somebody to the dance, you got to leave for the dance with them. Okay? Yeah. You can't you can't take you can't dump that person off, take somebody else home. Anybody else have a question? I can't believe I left with you. Thank you for the body heat is warmed up in here significantly. Thank you for coming. Well, be great.